Uh, you are good. So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this webinar entitled Neck Ultrasonography. What can you really see and how can it help your practice? Presented by Dr. Jennifer Sipas. By the conclusion of this webinar, participants should be able to outline the indications for sonography of the neck and provide an overview of pathology that may be seen on an ultrasound of the neck. We'd like to recognize and thank SAOTE for their educational grant in support of this webinar. This webinar is not eligible for CME credit. During today's presentation, if you have questions for the presenter, you may be, type them into the question box on the right side of your screen. You will be able to submit question, questions throughout this webinar, but the presenter will not begin answering until the end of the presentation, at which time she will answer as many questions as possible. A recording of this webinar will be available on the AIUM YouTube page. And now I'm pleased to present Dr. Jennifer Sipas. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank you all for tuning in as I talk to you about the ultrasonography of the neck. I also want to thank SAOTE for helping to make this webinar possible. I hope to share with you today why I think sonography is an important part of the examination of the neck and how it can be used to identify abnormalities, not just thyroid nodules. We're going to start by discussing the normal anatomy of the neck. Then we'll review the two main classification systems in use for thyroid nodule risk stratification. I'm going to outline the use of ultrasonography for the guidance of fine needle aspiration in nodules and other neck masses. Then we'll discuss other applica applications for ultrasonography with neck anatomy, including scanning for abnormal lymph nodes, identification of parathyroid adenomas, and I'll show you a few other normal uh, anatomic variants. We'll then um, finish off with a brief outline of how to scan the vocal cords at the bedside, and I'll show you a couple of videos of actual vocal cord ultrasound examinations. It's important to consider the use of ultrasonography because it changes the management of patients with thyroid nodule. One study from the Thyroid Nodule Clinic at the Brigham and Women's Hospital found that ultrasound examination changed the clinical management decision in 63% of patients. It's important to recognize, though, that the uh, palpation is not an accurate form of identification of thyroid nodules in a significant nor uh, proportion of patients. When a nodule is palpated on exam, 16% of patients will not have a corresponding nodule on ultrasound. Another 15% will have an additional non-palpable nodule measuring one centimeter or more elsewhere in the gland that can only be identified sonographically. Consequently, it's recommended by both the American Thyroid Association, the uh, Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, and the Amer uh, European Thyroid Association that all patients suspected of having a nodule should undergo an ultrasound of the neck. I would argue that a comprehensive examination of the neck should also be considered at the time of initial evaluation for thyroid nodules for two reasons. Thyroid cancer, when present, has a high frequency of metastatic lymph nodes. Identification of such a node will alter the surgical approach. And identification of a suspicious node may warrant FNA of a node in lieu of uh, FNA of a nodule, or at least in addition to FNA of the nodule. So I want to transition to a discussion of the normal anatomy of the neck. It's important to be familiar with normal anatomy of the anterior neck because this will help you to no narrow the differential diagnosis of any masses or abnormalities that may be identified on uh, ultrasound. The thyroid lies directly over the trachea at the level of the second and third tracheal rings. Now, op, they also, it also lies opposite the fifth, sixth, seventh cervical vertebrae, which can be seen on ultrasound, and we'll go through that later in the talk. The cricothyroid muscles lie directly superior to the thyroid and can be seen medially when moving superiorly over the thyroid in the midline. The posterior view of the thyroid, uh, or uh, sorry, the posterior view of the anterior neck is important to identify other critical structures um, as this may impact patient care. 
the recurrent laryngeal nerve as it comes off the vagus nerve can be seen in this posterior view here. And as you can see, it's proximity to the thyroid that can have implications on compression of the nerve. And this is why patients present with hoarseness. It's also important to recognize that the parathyroid glands lie posterior to the thyroid. Uh, the superior glands may be seen in the midpole of the thyroid on the posterior surface. And the inferior glands generally are going to be located in the inferior pole of the thyroid or just inferior to the thyroid itself. Each lobe of the thyroid has an oval shape measuring generally between 2 by 2 by 5 centimeters. The size and the shape of the thyroid varies greatly. The main determinants of size are gender of the patient and size of the patient. Those patients that are taller are generally going to have a larger thyroid gland, and in general, men will have a larger gland than women. The normal adult thyroid volume is somewhere between 10 to 20 cc's. The, this is a labeled transverse view of the entire thyroid and the surrounding structures. By convention, when we're scanning a patient in the transverse view, the probe is going to be on the center of the patient's neck when they're lying in a supine position. The end of the probe on the left side of the screen, represented by this black bar, um, should be aligned to the patient's right side. This will allow you to understand which side of the neck represents the right lobe of the thyroid versus the left lobe of the thyroid, and it will be uh, standard across every uh, ultrasound examination that's performed. The trachea is a distinctive U-shaped, upside-down U-shaped, um, as you can see here in this image, and that's due to signal dropout from the ultrasound waves as they come from the probe and they bounce off of the cartilaginous rings of the trachea and back into the probe um, of the ultrasound. Then we get a posterior signal dropout as these waves, uh, ultrasound waves are unable to penetrate the cartilaginous uh, tracheal rings. It's important to note as well that the thyroid itself is homogeneous in echotexture. Um, this is the normal appearance of the gland. This echogenicity or color is brighter than the surrounding strap muscles. And the reason um, is that the thyroid itself is, is fairly posse cellular in comparison to the surrounding strap muscles uh, where there's uh, increased cellularity. So the reason that various structures appear differently on ultrasound is due to the variability of ultrasound wave transmission through the soft tissues. And this change in tissue density as the ultrasound wave travels through the various tissues and get reflected back to the probe is what allows us to distinguish these interfaces between the various soft tissues. <clears throat> Uh, as far as the thyroid itself is concerned, in terms of the echogenicity, and it should be homogeneously echo, uh, echoic, if the gland is hypoechoic compared to how it normally should be, or it's patchy in its distribution of the echogenicity, that can be a marker of an infiltrative process such as Hashimoto's disease. And with this disorder, the gland is infiltrated with lymphocytes, and as a result, you can actually see this increased cellularity with that patchy distribution of echogenicity. Another important finding on this particular image is the appearance of the carotid and the jugular uh, vasculature. These appear as black or anechoic. Uh, this is important to recognize and will help you in identification of a fluid-filled cyst. And as well, posterior to these structures, you can notice a brightness um, or increased echogenicity as the ultrasound waves travel through the, the fluid and pick back up with increased intensity and posterior to that. Um, and that will allow you as well to recognize that anterior to this hyperechoic area is a fluid-filled structure. <clears throat> This is a longitudinal or sagittal view of the thyroid. You can appreciate the tapered shape of the gland. By convention, when scanning a patient in the sagittal view, the patient's head should be aligned with the portion of the probe on the left side of the screen represented by the star. Proper te scanning technique, again, is critical so you can identify the location of pathology just by looking at its relationship to normal anatomic landmarks. 
And in this case, the inferior pole of the thyroid should always be on the left side of the screen and the superior pole on the right side of the screen. So if the patient has a nodule somewhere within this gland, you can describe where it is within the thyroid itself. As I mentioned earlier, normal, normal thyroid tissue is brighter than surrounding strap muscles. It should be of similar echogenicity to the submandibular gland. This is a helpful comparator when it's difficult to discern if the thyroid is hypoechoic or darker than it should be. You can scan up to the submandibular gland to see what the thyroid echogenicity should be and then compare that to what is actually seen. When describing a thyroid nodule, its echogenicity should be defined relative to normal thyroid tissue. If a patient has a nodule and a generally hypoechoic thyroid, such as may be seen in Hashimoto's thyroiditis, the nodule echogenicity should be compared to what normal tissue looks like, not compared to the thyroid, thyroid tissue surrounding that nodule. So by convention, if the nodule is the same echogenicity as normal thyroid tissue, it is referred to as isoechoic. If the nodule is brighter than the surrounding thyroid, it is hyperechoic. If it's darker than normal thyroid tissue, it's defined as hypoechoic. And a markedly hypoechoic nodule is defined relative to the strap muscles. Uh, so it should be as dark as or darker than the surrounding strap, mu strap muscles. Iso and hyperechoic nodules generally have a lower risk of malignancy, whereas hypoechoic nodules have a higher risk of malignancy. You can see that the specificity of this finding is low, however, and this is because most nodules are hypoechoic, but not all hypoechoic nodules are malignant. Marked hypoechogenicity is far more specific for malignancy at 94%, but it is less commonly seen. This is a side-by-side -side comparison of the thyroid on the left and the submandibular gland on the right, and you can appreciate the echogenicity and the texture as being very similar. The isthmus is, is in a normal thyroid is generally very thin. It measures less than three to four millimeters. When it's thickened to five millimeters or more, this can be a marker of a diffuse thyroid disorder uh, in the absence of a nodule in the isthmus. The thickness of the isthmus should be documented in an ultrasound report. When measuring the thyroid, you should use a standardized approach. Uh, the, the dimensions are the width, the depth, and the length. In the transverse view, some people will measure both the depth and the width. Um, however, others will measure the depth in the sagittal view, as we'll see in just a moment. The width should be measured uh, at a 90 degree angle from the depth uh, in the anterior posterior dimension. <clears throat> and the others will use the sagittal view at the largest point in the, uh, of the thyroid to measure the depth, which is represented by the uh, red arrow. The length is the white arrow. When measuring the thyroid lobe volume, the definition is the um, pi over 6 times the width times the depth times the length. Measurement of the volume of the gland is typically used for evaluation of an endemic goiter and also occasionally used in dosing for radioiodine therapy. Otherwise, it's not particularly useful in clinical practice. There's significant inter-observer variability in measurement of these uh, diameters of the thyroid sonographically. Indeed, studies of inter-observer variability have demonstrated that there must be a change in volume of greater than 50% to be statistically significant change in volume. And this is due to the variability in the measurements of individual diameters of the thyroid. So consequently, most clinicians will use the individual diameters of the gland in all three directions to follow for a change in the size of the gland. When examining the normal thyroid, one can see embryonic remnants of normal descent from the base of the tongue, and this is referred to as the pyramidal lobe. It's also known as the thyroglossal duct remnant if it's detached from the thyroid. The small finger of tissue can be seen extending up from the isthmus of the thyroid in the midline, um, and it represents a tail of tissue that failed to regress as the thyroid descended from its uh, origins at the base of the tongue during embryogenesis. 
these are frequently seen in patients if you are looking for them, and they're often missed surgically when patients undergo total thyroidectomy, and this is a common source for uh, increased activity in the neck on post-treatment scanning after treatment with radioactive iodine. And this is just an example of what the pyramidal lobe looks like. It may appear as a distinct component of thyroid tissue separate from the lobe in the transverse view. Um, or it may appear as a little extension of tissue in the midline uh, extending from the superior pole. Another embryonic uh, variant that may be seen is the tubercle azucocondyl. The majority of thyroid tissue extends from the base of the tongue down to its residence at the lower neck just above the clavicles during embryogenesis but about a third to a fourth of the thyroid is derived from tissue in the fourth pharyngeal pouch and descends medially uh, from those lateral pouches and joins, uh, fuses with the thyroid medially um, that was descended from above. Surgeons describe this as a small thumb of tissue that is posteriorly attached to the thyroid. This is an important area to recognize as it can contain parathyroid tissue, and this is where the thyroid C cells are derived from. And these are some examples of tubercles of zucrocondyl. They're frequently mistaken as thyroid nodules. As you can see, they appear to be distinct from the surrounding thyroid tissue. Um, as a rule, however, thyroid nodules will never be outlined by a white line. Um, so you can rule that out as a possible nodule, though a nodule may be contained within the, within the tubercle of zucrocondyl. In this case, in the transverse view, it looks like a distinct entity, but in the sagittal view, um, you can see that it is contiguous with the remainder of the thyroid, as this is just a small fibrous band. These fibrous bands are typically easier to see when the gland is hypoechoic from underlying Hashimoto's disease, as is seen in this example. This gland is dark, um, allowing for more direct visualization of that hyperechoic fibrous band. Thyroid nodules are very, very common. Their incidence increases directly with patient age. Uh, this is important for clinicians to recognize and patients are diagnosed with a nodule, they often become quite anxious about the new diagnosis, giving um, concerns about the possibility of uh, harboring a malignancy in that nodule. Fortunately, only a, approximately 7 to 14 percent of nodules are indeed malignant. Um, but it is an important tool to ha it is important to have an efficient tool for stratification of these nodules. And ultrasound is an ideal imaging modality for this initial evaluation. It's inexpensive, highly sensitive, and easy to perform at the bedside. Over the last 30 years, the incidence of thyroid cancer has more than has nearly tripled. Many, attri many attribute this increase in incidence to the increased use of diagnostic imaging. They argue that increased diagnostic scrutiny has led to identification of indolent disease that would never have come to clinical identification if not incidentally discovered on imaging for some other reason. In fact, autopsy studies have demonstrated that the incidence of thyroid cancers that were undiagnosed while the patient was living is is a thousandfold higher than the incidence of those that are clinically detected while patients are alive. So there is clearly a large reservoir of undiagnosed cancers, and with the increased use of imaging, many of these are coming to clinical detection. And for this reason, we should not advocate for screening ultrasounds of the neck, as many of these tumors, if left alone, would have never come to any clinical meaningful significance. It's important to remember, though, that large, aggressive cancers were once small tumors, and clinicians must be able to triage thyroid nodules to distinguish those tumors that are clinically meaningful from those that never would have come to clinical attention. Fortunately, ultrasound of the neck is a very helpful tool in identifying clinically significant cancers. This is a study of 488 papillary thyroid carcinomas that was retrospectively uh, evaluated for the sonographic appearance of the malignancy to determine if that sonographic appearance predicted biologic behavior. The cancers were divided into benign appearing lesions or those that lacked any suspicious sonographic features or those that were more malignant appearing. 
the benign appearing cancers accounted for about 15% of all the cancers in this cohort. The malignant appearing tumors frequently had, or more frequently had, lymph node metastases, extrathyroidal extension, and higher stage disease at presentation than the benign or the more benign appearing uh, tumors. And as the number of malignant ultrasound features increased, multifocality, extrathyroidal extension, lymph node metastases, and a higher disease stage were more likely. Thus, the sonographic features are helpful in, in identifying those more aggressive tumors. Now I want to review some of the sonographic features that can be used to identify significant cancers and help distinguish them from less aggressive lesions. This table lists the features of a nodule that are associated with a higher risk of malignancy. The wide range of specificity of these findings highlights one of the major limitations of using individual ultrasound features to predict malignancy risk in a given nodule. The range of specificity is largely due to inter-observer variability in calling these individual features. Some of these sonographic findings are indeed difficult to agree upon from one observer to the next. Another limitation to using individual features is the low sensitivity. Not all malignancies are going to harbor one of these suspicious sonographic findings. However, most nodules do fall into patterns, and there's much better reproducibility in assigning malignancy risk using pattern recognition instead of individual features. Consequently, the American Thyroid Association created this tiered pattern-based uh, stratification system to assign malignancy risk to a nodule. This five-tiered system provides in both a risk of malignancy for each pattern and it offers a threshold for recommendation of uh, FNA consideration. With lower risk nodules, the size at which FNA is recommended is larger. And so we're going to now go through these individual categories. Simple cysts, as you show in here, are benign lesions. When they are seen, we can absolutely reassure our patients that they do not harbor a malignancy and they do not require FNA. An FNA of a larger cyst may be desired if it causes uh, compressive symptoms, and to try to alleviate those compressive symptoms, we could remove some of the cystic content. It's important to recognize, however, that removal of this content often results in reaccumulation of the fluid in a short period of time. So patients should be uh, advised of that possibility. So while it's reassuring to see a simple cyst on ultrasound, these are fairly rare uh, entities and are usually only seen in about 1% of all nodules. The very low suspicion nodules are partially cystic and they're far more commonly seen. And as a general rule, the greater the cystic content, the lower the likelihood of malignancy. This category includes nodules that are partially cystic and they all lack suspicious sonographic features. And many of the nodules within this category are classified as spongiform nodules as represented by this cartoon. These nodules represent a greater than 50% microcystic architecture and they look like a sponge in cross section. Spongiform nodules such as these have a very low risk of malignancy. They can be observed or, if desired, they can be aspirated when larger than two centimeters. It should be noted, though, because these have such a large cystic content, they often are non-diagnostic on FNA, um, and patients should be advised of such. The low suspicion categories of, category of nodules harbor the malignancy risk of 5 to 10 percent. These are isoechoic and hyperechoic nodules with no suspicious ultrasound features. Or they may be partially cystic with an eccentric solid component that also lacks suspicious features. Only 15 to 20 percent of cancers are isoechoic or hyperechoic. Um, these lesions, when they are malignant, are either usually a follicular variant of papillary cancer or they may represent a follicular thyroid carcinoma. And recognition that the risk of distant metastases with a follicular thyroid carcinoma is extremely low in tumors less than two centimeters, the threshold for FNA of these lesions is one, a, one and a half centimeters. Other classification systems, including the American Thyroid, uh, sorry, the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, and the ETA system, as well as the TIRAD system, uses significantly higher threshold for FNA in this group of nodules, and we'll review that shortly. 
Hypoechoic solid nodules with a smooth, regular border and lacking suspicious ultrasound features have an intermediate risk of malignancy between 10 to 20 percent. These nodules lack evidence of extrathyroidal extension, calcifications, or a taller than wide shape. This pattern has the highest sensitivity for identifying malignancy at 60 to 80 percent, but lacks specificity. As such, the, thres the threshold for FNA of these lesions is one centimeter. Nodules that are hypoechoic and solid or have a hypoechoic solid component within a cystic nodule and have one or more suspicious ultrasound features are deemed high-risk nodules. These nodules typically represent a papillary thyroid carcinoma. The specific suspicious features include an irregular or infiltrative margin, microcalcifications, taller than wide shape, a disrupted rim calcification with extrusive soft tissue component or extrathyroidal extension. Additionally, the presence of a suspicious lymph node increases the likelihood of malignancy as seen in the upper left image here. This is a suspicious rounded iso or hyperechoic lymph node and then the associated thyroid nodule with microcalcifications within it. The bottom left image demonstrates a taller than wide nodule. The depth of the nodule is greater than the width. Uh, this is an aggressive growth pattern. The normal growth pattern of a thyroid nodule is in the transfer in the transverse view is in the in the width of the nodule. This nodule also has irregular margins and a coarse calcification. This nodule is markedly hypoechoic. Uh, and has several microcalcifications within it. And this nodule on the bottom represents an interrupted rim calcification with areas of soft tissue extrusion. These are all malignancies. The American College of Radiology recently published this white paper to stratify malignancy risk of nodules based on individual sonographic features. Their desire was to create a uniform system of reporting nodules to providers to convey not only the malignancy risk of a nodule, but also to provide thresholds for FNA, as well as guidance on follow-up intervals of these nodules when they're benign. In a nod to the BIRAD system for mammography, this system is called TIRADS, or Thyroid Imaging Reporting and Data System. The system assigns a score for each of the five sonographic uh, features listed above in the blue. And the higher the score, the higher the risk of malignancy, as well as the lower size threshold for FNA. So these individual features are summed up and a, a, soar, a score is assigned. TIRAD 5 nodules um, are highly suspicious. The FNA threshold is a centimeter. Um, these nodules should be followed if they're greater than half a centimeter. And if they enlarge to over a centimeter, they should um, then be aspirated. The uh, these these nodules should be followed annually with ultrasound for five years. TIRADS 4 nodules are moderately suspicious. When aspirated and are deemed benign, they should have follow-up at 1, 2, 3, and 5 years. TIRADS 3 nodules um, have a size threshold of 2.5 centimeters, and these correlate with the ATA low suspicion nodules where the threshold for FNA is 1.5 centimeters. Um, these nodules should be followed at years 1, 3, and 5. There are several classification systems that are available, and they all perform very well in predicting malignancy risk. The system that's used is largely based on provider preference. Both of the systems that I have outlined are widely used in clinical practice um, and um, are, are under various stages of comparison from one to the other in terms of their performance. It's important to recognize that we're not only going to identify nodules on ultrasound, many other disease states may be seen. Hashimoto's thyroiditis is large, is very recognizable on ultrasound. The characteristic appearance is one of a diffusely heterogeneous gland instead of the homogeneously isoechoic gland. Individual patterns can vary from a microcystic appearance seen below uh, to a diffusely nodular appearance. Some folks have described these glands as having a bit of a giraffe pattern, um, particularly this upper example here. These glands can be enlarged in the early phases of the disease or they can atrophy over time. 
And the si these findings of, for uh, Hashimoto's disease on ultrasound are highly sensitive. Sonographic changes can occur prior to the development of anti antibody positivity and even long before the development of thyroid function test abnormalities. Similarly, Graves' disease has a characteristic ultrasound appearance. The heterogeneity and, and enlargement of the gland can mimic changes that are seen in Hashimoto's thyroiditis. The distinctive feature in Graves' disease is the diffusely increased vascularity of the gland, which is seen here. This has been termed the thyroid inferno, and it may even be heard on auscultation of the thyroid as a brewery. This degree of vascularity is going to vary from patient to patient and as well with treatment. With thionamide treatment, we generally see a reduction in the vascularity of the disease. One of the most important uses of ultrasound is for guidance of needle placement during fine needle aspiration. Prior to the widespread availability of ultrasound, non-diagnostic rates on FNA were significantly higher. This is largely due to the cystic component of many nodules, and we want to aspirate the solid component of the nodule. Without the aid of ultrasound, we're not able to distinguish which parts of the nodule contain fluid or solid material. If we aspirate material from the cystic component, we're going to obtain macrophages and cystic debris. Additionally, the use of ultrasound allows for aspiration of various parts within a solid nodule to ensure an adequate representation of the cytology of the entire nodule. In the hands of an experienced clinician, uh, non-diagnostic rates of ultrasound-guided FNA should be less than 5%. This is an example of a cystic nodule that appears to have a solid area represented here, uh, but when you put col color Doppler on that area, you can appreciate there is no vascularity to that tissue, um, and indeed this represents uh, avascular debris. So utilizing the ultrasound not only to guide your needle into the solid components, but also to utilize the Doppler flow to identify areas of viable tissue. This is another example of a cystic nodule that appears to have several areas of solid component. Um, Palpation-guided biopsy of this lesion was non-diagnostic. On putting the Doppler flow, you can see a couple of areas of increased vascularity, suggestive of viable tissue. And aspiration of this lesion, you can see the, the needle represented here by this bright line, uh, revealed a cystic papillary thyroid carcinoma. Now, there are two techniques to perform FNA, the parallel approach and the perpendicular uh, technique. <clears throat> Each methodology has various merits and negative uh, components associated with it. In the parallel technique, the needle is placed on the short edge of the, the probe. It should be placed right next to the probe. Uh, <clears throat> And then the, the needle, the entire shaft of the needle can be seen as it penetrates into the nodule. Now, it's the downside of utilizing this approach is more, more component of the needle itself needs to go through the patient tissue in order to access the nodule. In contrast, the perpendicular technique is a more direct path to the nodule. <clears throat> the needle is placed in the middle of the long angle of the probe, <clears throat> and then it's placed directly above the nodule and into the nodule under ultrasound guidance. The downside of this approach is only the needle tip may be seen. So this methodology requires a little more skill in understanding the spatial relationships of the nodule in association with the probe um, to guide the needle into the nodule. <clears throat> Most clinicians will have one preferred method. However, all should be able to perform both techniques as there are going to be times that their, their typical preferred methodology may not be employable due to interference from fixed structures like the trachea or the clavicle. Another important use of ultrasound is for the evaluation of cervical lymph nodes. Thyroid cancer has a high rate of nodal metastases, as I mentioned earlier. The identification of a suspicious lymph node can alter the surgical approach, and several studies have determined that the preoperative ultrasound of the neck will change the surgical approach in up to 40% of patients. Uh, as such, the American Thyroid Association 
strongly recommends that if not already performed, an ultrasound of the neck should be done to examine for cervical nodal involvement prior to going to surgery for malignancy or suspicious cytologic or molecular findings. So I'd like to briefly review the appearance of benign nodes then contrast that with suspicious adenopathy. <clears throat> Benign, benign adenopathy is typically fusiform or oval-shaped with a central echogenic hilus. This is also called the hilum. The hilum may appear uh, as a thin white line or as a fa more fatty hilum here in the red. It's, this typically represents the central vascular and lymphatic outflow tract of the node as can be seen in the cartoon. The presence of a hilum is highly reassuring for a benign node. The absence of a hilum in a lymph node does not always indicate malignancy, however. It may raise the level of the concern slightly, but the, the rotation of the node in relation to the ultrasound probe may prohibit the visualization of the hilum. There are other more specific sonographic features that predict malignancy. In this slide, you can, these are all examples of malignant nodes. Cystic degeneration within a node is malignancy until proven otherwise. Tuberculosis or scrofula can also cause cystic degeneration, but thankfully this is particularly rare. The presence of calcifications, as shown by the yellow arrows here and here, are also very concerning for malignancy within a node. In this bottom right image, this node is solid, uh, but it is more rounded in shape than the previous examples I showed you. And the more round appearing a node is, the more concerning it is for malignancy. It's important, though, to, just, to view these types of nodes in both the transverse view and the sagittal view, because depending on the orientation of the node relative to the probe, it may appear elongated when viewed in one direction as opposed to the others. This elongation of the node makes it appear less suspicious. This particular node is malignant, however, and this calcification certainly increased that risk of malignancy in this particular node. Another feature that can be used to distinguish benign from malignant nodes is the color Doppler. Uh, this vascular flow in these nodes is normal. Um, the, the vascularity may appear as a single dot within the hilum, or it may be absent. These are some suspicious nodes. As they undergo malignant transformation, a blood must be supplied to the neoplastic tissue. Uh, malignant nodes thus lose their normal central Doppler flow and will demonstrate more peripheral flow or make more chaotic in, uh, internal uh, flow throughout the nodes. Thyroid cancer has historically been associated with a high rate of recurrence. The traditional mode of detection of recurrent or residual disease was the diagnostic whole body radioiodine scan. These scans have a very low sensitivity for detecting disease at around 20%. Ultrasound is now the recommended mode of imaging for detection of recurrent or residual, residual cervical nodal disease. It's employed periodically in the follow-up of patients after surgery for papillary thyroid cancer. Ultrasounds also increasingly being utilized for the preoperative identification of parathyroid adenomas, and when identified by ultrasound, they are highly predictive of an abnormal gland. The sensitivity of identification of these glands is highly operator dependent. Normal parathyroid tissue is not visible sonographically. An enlarged gland, however, has a characteristic ultrasound appearance. It is oval to rounded in shape and uniformly hypoechoic. They may be difficult to discern from a thyroid nodule depending upon their location. Sonographer may need to have a high index of suspicion to consider a parathyroid adenoma in the differential diagnosis. But Doppler flow can improve that uh, testing. And if you can see a polar feeding vessel as seen in this example, that may be increase your concern for a parathyroid adenoma. If it's unclear that a lesion such as this represents a posterior thyroid nodule or a parathyroid adenoma, a PTH washout measurement can be performed. Occasionally, a parathyroid cyst may be identified as well. These are benign and do not require any further intervention unless they cause compressive symptoms. Elastography is a relatively new technology which is available on many new ultrasound machines and can help stratify the risk of malignancy based on tissue stiffness. 
The probe is placed over the nodule while the sonographer places a certain amount of pressure on the skin uh, using the probe. The degree of tissue strain or elasticity of the tissue is calculated and a color is assigned. In this example, harder tissues appear blue, uh, which increases the likelihood of malignancy. It's important to note that this technology is less useful for cystic lesions or in a multinodular goiter where there may be overlapping nodules. One of the more exciting new uses of ultrasonography is vocal cord ultrasound. Patients often stress about having to undergo direct laryngoscopy prior to surgery, and it's difficult for them to remain compliant through the examination. This non-invasive technique allows for direct visualization of the vocal cords and their movement. They will appear as a centrally inverted V with echogenic lines that will move medially uh, with passive inspiration. The retinoids may also be seen uh, if the vocal cords themselves may not be seen. This is a very useful tool to stratify patients for further evaluation with direct laryngoscopy, and it can also be helpful to follow patients after surgery for improvement in vocal cord functions. In the hands of an experienced sonographer, they may be able to accurately visualize, visualize the cords in up to 95% of patients prior to surgery. The cords are best visualized when the probe is placed over the thyroid cartilage with the patient in the supine position. And those with greater degrees of calcification of the thyroid cartilage, it may obscure visualization. This is particularly the case with men and occasionally in elderly females. To perform this exam, the probe is placed over the midline, over the thyroid cartilage. The frequency of the probe should be lowered as much as possible, typically to 8 or 9 megahertz. The focal zone of the probe should be placed at the level of the cords. Once the gain is increased to make the screen wider, often the cords can be visualized. The probe should be held still in place while watching for medialization of the cords. Um, in order to see visualization, the Valsalva maneuver can be performed. And I'll show you a couple of clips. So you can see the vocal cords here and they will medialize there. These are the retinoids. You can see movement of the cords. This is going to loop again. Now you can see the false focal cords there, and then the vibration of the cords. And that's with the Valsalva they will medialize. Now this is a case of a patient with a right vocal cord paralysis. Her left cord is mobile, and you can make the cord out right there, and it's medializing. The left cord, I'm sorry, the right cord is not moving at all. There's the cord, and it's coming to midline. This is the, a cartoon of the transverse anatomy of the lateral neck. Uh, and this is designed to uh, outline some of the structures that can be seen in addition to the thyroid. The, between the anterior scalene and the middle scalene, the brachial plexus may be seen. Uh, the lymph nodes that we are looking for are going to be lateral to the carotid and the jugular, uh, just behind the sternocleidomastoid and anterior to the anterior scalene. As well, we may be able to see the transverse spinous processes on ultrasound. So these are the transverse spinous processes. They appear as a hyperlucency with posterior acoustic dropout. Um, this is in the sagittal view, and in the transverse view, they're going to appear just lateral to the carotid. And the brachial plexus may be seen between the scalene muscles uh, as these three or uh, four round structures. And with that, I will take any additional questions. Do we have any questions from anyone? <clears throat> okay, well, giving a moment. All right, well then, thank you, Dr. Sipas. And on behalf of the AIUM and our supporter, SAOTE, our thanks to all of you who participated in today's webinar. Please remember to complete the activity evaluation 
and we hope you enjoyed this presentation and will join us again for future webinars. Thank you. Thank you.